So I have something else for you. That's all right. Okay. So this one takes a while to build and up. Give me to. just a, before we yeah, yeah. end tonight. I do want to read that one, one uh, paragraph from my summary. Yes, I, that I have made a mental note that that's, uh, okay, we're going to go back to you there. So um, a bit of a build up. So you described daily life at Antioch when you were there as centering intensely in the gladiatorial exchange of strongly held views. And I think in that way, Antioch hasn't changed. From which you needed from time to time to escape to Glen Helen. You seem to have been drawn to and inspired by your entire life, the most dynamic and generative minds of your generation and the most vibrant venues of powerful thinking and action in today's act period. In today's climate of sound bites, simplistic orthodoxies and profound polarization how do we lead ourselves back to healthy and critical discourse? I, I sort of hinted at it, Neil, a little, little earlier, early on, when I was talking about what I think the foundation of our country really, when I said uh, one of the tasks of a leader is to keep reminding people of what's important. And I think uh, when you think about the great, great leaders of our nation, uh, in one way or another, they, they did that. One of the marvelous things about that, when you think about everybody here has seen that 1963 August Martin Luther King Jr. speech. If you, we show that to our class every year, not the whole speech, but it wasn't that long anyway. But he was really talking about how can you segregate a society which is based on the Constitution? How could you have a, a, a and, and it wasn't until Truman that we actually had a desegregated military, for God's sakes. That's like, uh, 1948? Truman, Truman took office in 45, right? So it was right after the war was over, it was desegregated. Imagine. Uh, so if, I think what, what, the, what, what must happen, at, certainly at, this, at a national government level, is to keep bringing people together in this very diverse, and what's more diverse than the city we're living in, uh, the, the greater Los Angeles area? I mean, it's, it's beautifully diverse and challengingly, challengingly diverse. But I think the leader has got to, without sounding cliche-ish about this, create a, 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 an emblem of the basic principles of what this country is all about. And it's basically what this country is all about is that we collectively, we collaboratively aligned to seek a common goal. Nothing, nothing will get in our way. And somehow or another, I think our leadership yet, and I don't like harping on, on this too much, but has yet to make us feel proud of who we, who we are. You see, Nehru once said about the great, one of the great leaders of the 20th century, um, Mohandas Gandhi, he said, he, Nehru said, Gandhi made us, made India, made India proud of herself. Wow. I mean, if we could, and we have a lot to be proud of. We also have a lot to be, you know, the other question about the cynicism and the corruption and the Wall Street stuff. And, you know, I, I started a survey a few years ago working with some folks at some other universities on a leadership confidence survey of every single, insti you know, basic institutions in this country. It goes from 05 to 09. We weren't able to get funding for it beyond 09 and last. But if you looked at, so it has roughly 15, 16 institutions like medicine, like education, like the press, like Wall Street, and so on. And they've all pretty much, with the exception of, of um, medicine, which is, hasn't gone up, but is sort of plateauish. And then it was, um, so medicine was pretty much plateauing, but not greatly. But the amount of distrust, and yet the same survey we did, that 85% of those surveyed, it was a national survey, believed that with good leadership, our country could solve these, these problems. This is what we're facing in this, this election, this coming election on Tuesday. 
this is what we're facing in, in 2012. And it, it, I don't want to sound preachy about this, but but um, getting our, I know that our, our, the millennials went out and voted in the last presidential election. And, he, and Obama was on the USC campus on, was it um, Friday? Friday, I think it was. Yeah, 37,000 people. And he threw the gauntlet to these, to these students. And all of us, though, not just the millennials and those, but uh, we have such an important. But the only way it's going to happen when we recognize, I don't know how else to say it, our, our oneness, when we recognize the foundations of what made our country so powerful, economically and militarily, we are still number one. And, you know, if we look at the emerging countries, we, 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 are not, we should not be a happy, complacent number one. We are not. And I think that's the challenge that we're facing, and that's the challenge. I think we have the talent, the brain power, but I don't think it's yet motivated enough to get up early Tuesday and get out there to work at the precinct level. Uh, to get, you know, and, you know, but there's nothing, there's nothing we can't do, but we've got to see results, which it isn't just enough to say uh, whatever the Obama campaign was running on, what was it, uh, we can do it or something like that. Yes, we can. Uh, we, yes, we can, but we need actually to uh, do more than chant a terrific phrase like that and get out there and start working, creating. And I don't want to go into what I would recommend because it's too easy to be in an armchair sitting in the bleachers. But I do think this will happen. I think we're going to be very surprised at what what's going to happen in even in the coming election, but even more so in in 12. I think um, I just have too much faith in what we've been able to do in the past and what we're capable of doing in the future. I cannot believe we're going to not take advantage of all the brain power I know, for example, in this room tonight.